that you're going to say, we hear that about every Sunday. <laughs> that is one of my favorite songs, and I know it's brother Stephen as well. Bless you, brother Stephen. A couple weeks ago, uh, some of us had a chance to go to our association meeting, and, uh, and we were blessed two nights, uh, various speakers, and um, the direction was the same. Uh, throughout both nights of service, and that is our responsibility as Christians, and then of course churches and then association, as to how we uh, how we uh, associate with the world around us that's uh, lost. And by that I mean they don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. They have not trusted Him. And, and I'm going to say believe, believe with the, believe with the definition of commitment. Because you can ask the question, can't you? To a lot of people in this world today, and you can ask them, do you believe in Jesus? And, and, and if they've heard of him, most likely they're going to say, yes, I believe it. Here's where we have to also be careful as, as people who say we believe, people that trust him. Do, do we commit ourselves to Jesus and his ways? Thank you, Bill Carl. I, I want us to understand what belief is all about. I want us to understand from a scripture perspective, from Jesus himself perspective, that it really means that we have committed our life. And, and some would say, well, sure I have. I, I can't wait that when, when this world is over with, I get to go to heaven. That's not what I mean by commitment. Because sure enough, if a person saved, if a person is reborn, important to understand what that means. Their life has been changed completely by Jesus Christ and the working of the Holy Spirit. Then they're going to go to heaven. But it's not a matter of knowledge, it's a matter of heart. And so, a couple of years ago, I attended the uh, North Carolina Baptist Convention, and uh, I saw a film clip that just touched my heart, so that'd be nice to show a church one day. And then, lo and behold, last week, I guess it was, uh, it was shown at our association meeting, and I was able to get a copy of this. And I told you that today, uh, that I was going to emphasize my hope, because we're coming really this week is the emphasis. But I really don't know if there's any other better way to do that than to hear on the word discipleship. Because that comes directly from Jesus himself. So I want to encourage you to watch this clip for just a moment.
again, we thank you for this opportunity that we are able to come today and to worship you. And we've had uh, a glorious time in music and uh, the wonderful words of those songs that touch our hearts and, and guides us in many ways, Father, as we open ourselves to the message of those songs. And the prayers, Father, I, I pray that you, you, you heard from us and that we would hear from heaven as well. And Father, I pray in the next few moments that you would help me to bring clarity to what you placed on my mind and the direction uh, for our church in the days and weeks to come and how, and how we might be more obedient to you. But first, how we might know you, truly know you, how we might believe you, truly believe you and who you are. And what you have done for us through your son, Jesus Christ, who set the example for each and every one of us. Father, I, I pray that we, that we just make a commitment in our own heart that we would not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray that uh, we would go ahead and set in our hearts that we would be willing to share our testimonies to people that uh, do not know who you are, that are looking for some hope in life and that are hurting. And, and Father, we, we say as your children that we know that. We experience that. We, we have that in Jesus Christ. Father, I ask that you help us not to be one that would hold back and, and uh, hold back from sharing what we know in Jesus, how it might benefit, how it might make a life <coughs> somebody else's heart, Father. So, Father, I ask in the next few moments that you, again, give us clarity for this day that we move into this week. And, and we acknowledge uh, Dr. Graham's uh, ministry and what he hopes to do this week and, and the next four or five days through this special presentation that will be televised. Father, I, I ask that you, you meet us where we are right now today in our hearts and our that we would experience who you are even more, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. And the church says amen. amen. Well, for months, we've been talking about the special emphasis of my hope. And uh, various occasions, uh, in bulletin inserts, you receive the cut sheet. This is not it, but you received a cut sheet in it that uh, gave an opportunity for you to write down names of people that that you know uh, you're not sure of their salvation experience, that uh, that are lost, and um, and that if if uh, you were the only one that could help them, then you needed to place their name on that list because it may depend on on you. A couple of weeks ago, you found this brochure in your, your bulletin as well, and it pretty much explained a little bit more about my hope, but it also gave an opportunity for you to complete, just like the cut sheet, names of people that you are aware of that need to know who Jesus is. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, because I'm just going to trust that you took these home, and you prayed over them, and you completed them. Now, I'm going to tell you this. I've asked this question many years ago, and I, I even asked for a show of hands, I believe, at that time. How many of you know lost people? And, no, you don't have to raise your hand now this morning, but you, you, it's okay to know lost people. I know some in my family. So I know some lost people. I know some in the community. I'm not going to say I know some in my workplace, but I used to when I was in the military. I'm hoping and praying everybody here knows Jesus Christ has trusted him. And that what we are sharing today as we've been speaking about for the last few months is really coming to a head, if you will, to how you can help someone that has not made that decision. <coughs> but I want to ask you a question. And you can raise your hand on this if you will. How many of you ever invited someone in your house to sell a product? 
Tupperware, handbags. Uh, what else is sold in your home now when you have these little parties? You get what I'm going here? Why did you do that? Why, why, would any, why would anybody invite anybody in your home to do such a thing? End result. Amen? Let me tell you, church, this is it. Why would you invite anybody into your home? What do you hope to be the end result of this? You're not trying to sell them anything. You're trying to introduce them to someone, and that is Jesus Christ. As much as I think all those things are important, by the way, I, I know about some of that stuff because she'll come home with a big old yellow pink slip. I ordered something. And I said, well, that's good. And that's all right. We do those things when we're, we're raising money, I guess, and, and they're, we're trying to get other people's attention. But folks, God is wanting to you, you and I, to get other people's attention in this world today. And I am so thankful so thankful for this particular campaign that uh, we've been looking at again off and on for the last two months that will help us to move to that point and the where we can invite somebody in our home, perhaps share a little meal with them, and watch the air in the Dr. Billy Graham, 28 minute, I think, air in it is. Give a little testimony as I demonstrate the one Sunday and ask. How do you like a pocketbook? Would you like to order one? How, how's the Tupperware? Would you like to order some? How do you like the message of Jesus Christ? Would you like to make Perhaps we don't put this on the screen enough and we should, our mission statement of our church, but we voted on it several years ago and it is hanging up in various parts of our church. But here's what it says, to be an intentional presence of Christ in our community as evidenced through the experiences of worship. We hope to pray people come into our church and experience what that's all about. But also we take our worship outside the church as well. In discipleship, evangelism, ministry, and fellowship and all those go hand in hand and I, I don't believe that you should do more of one and not the other by the way and sometimes churches can do that it really includes <coughs> what I call a well balanced church of God to minister to people John MacArthur and I, I love the Bible I love to study Bibles and the question was asked, of what does it mean to make disciples? And obviously from our, our clip you saw just a moment ago, it always goes to Matthew chapter 28. And when it reads like this, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then it says this, Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of of the age. Did you know you really can't disciple people correctly until they know who Jesus is? I asked a question about the newsletter a while ago, and I want to read this so every one of you can hear this if you haven't read it yet. And I put this in it uh, just for a minute. Everyone says, how much does discipleship cost? And I wrote, we have heard, I'm sure, many times that salvation is free, and it is, thank God. However, as I was reminded at our 64th annual session, at the Sand Hills Baptist Association meeting, we forget to state another important fact that should go along with that. But discipleship will cost you everything. It seems we've been cheating our salvation or what we thought when we are just hearers of the word and not doers. If we are truly believers of what Christ did for us, it will be evident by the way we live our life. Not only do we cheat ourselves, we are in big let down to those who need to see the truth lived out of us. The question is, is he, honestly, spiritually speaking? I believe we're leaving our new converts wet in the baptism pool and not producing true disciples. It's just something to think about and act upon. 
Jesus did give us the order to which we should help others to come to a state of knowledge of who he was. They come from a passage I just read. We are to go. In other words, as we are going into the world. Make disciples of them. In other words, share the love of God and the redeeming work of Christ. And then baptize them. And then teach them. In other words, make them growing disciples of, of, of their, their lives. That they continue the process of making disciples of others. And the question is, are we? Are we? Just something to think about and act upon. Depending on who you would ask when you look at that verse from Matthew 28, uh, you find a variety of interpretations regarding what it actually means to make disciples. And so most churches today, as Dr. Carper says, understand it is a command to evangelize the world, to lead people to faith and repentance in every corner of the world and spread the gospel as far as possible. And while there is a certainty of that, of the evangelistic aspect to Christ's command, his instructions go beyond just spreading the gospel. You see, Jesus' words emphasize not the moment of salvation, but the lifetime, lifetime of sanctification that follows. He made the point in John 8, 31 when he said, if you continue in <coughs> my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. It's the difference between a one-time profession of faith and a lifetime of spiritual growth and, and increasing godliness between counterfeit <coughs> and genuine conversion. Quote Dr. McCarthy. But he goes on to say, but if the mission of church is to make grow and learning believers in all nations, why do many congregations limit their efforts to fill in seats, often by meeting felt needs with worldly gimmicks? That strategy may attract non-believers, but how does it promote the spiritual growth of the believers already in their midst? How can you stress the vital importance of sanctification when you're aggressively chasing the trends and interests of a spiritually bankrupt world? What are we going to do with the ones that we have? In essence, that's what he's saying. It's nice to go out and break with others in. And that is our call, folks. <clears throat> It's not only to stay here and learn and grow and increase in our own faith. Yes, but that's important that we do that, as well as go out and seek the lost and the hurting of the world. As defined by Christ's command to his disciples, the purpose <coughs> of the church is to make learning believers, men and women, whose lives reflect a deep commitment to and love for God, his word. And his people. So a question would be, really, how much do we love God? Really? How much do we love? I mean, we think we know, and I believe we understand from Scripture how much he loves us, right? So much he did what? Yeah. The ultimate sacrifice if you will, the ultimate cost. And you know, i said this many times before, so you know, if I get home for pet statements, that's okay. I believe there are many people losing their lives today. You'll hear about that next Sunday as we look at the persecuted church. But I don't think God is asking you to all try to go and die for him. Some will. I think what he's asked us to do is go live to be a, a living example to the world that's around us. And, and why do we have this responsibility to go and meet new people? Or as we come in contact with new people, to somehow or other get in a conversation about where their heart is, spiritually speaking. And, and I love doing that, by the way. I, I, I love getting in a conversation with people and just get right to the question. And God allows, a, and when you open your heart, that for that the opportunity to do it. If you, if you just listen, the same Holy Spirit that led you to a personal relationship with Him, to trust Him, it's the same Holy Spirit that leads and guides us every day in our life if we allow Him to do that. Unfortunate thing is some people are just comfortable that they got saved. 
and they're not being saved and will be saved. <laughs> saved, yes, I, I've said a prayer, and I wrote a minute, and I'm just happy. Being saved means that we're growing, we've been sanctified, been set apart for His purpose. And I'm going to tell you what the common or general purpose is in our life is that we witness to lost people. This whole thing about my hope was not so much for you to start knocking on doors and asking people questions about where their life is. It really was about you addressing people you know already. And that really has been the emphasis had from this pulpit for the last few months. Who is it that you know that has not given an indication to you that they know Jesus personally, that they trust him? And those are, those are the people's names that you would have written on that sheet or in this brochure for your own, own purpose. And these were the people that you would take the opportunity to invite into your home and during this week as this presentation is made on TV. And these are the people that, first of all, you already, you already told them where you're at by an invite them home because you're not blindsided, right? You're telling them you want them to come into your home and watch a special presentation of Bill Graham, right? And if anybody knows anything about Bill Graham, they got to do something about Bill Graham, right? But you're already letting them in some way know where your heart is. It's just a simple testimony to how God has changed your life and just ask a question afterwards. What do you think about all this? Or are you in the process of this? <coughs> Would you like to know Jesus as your personal Savior? I say these things because I've done it many times. And maybe, well, there's no such thing as perfect as I'm always listening. Perfect is the Holy Spirit as through each process. But practice does help. Practice does help. And this week we're having this wonderful golden opportunity, as I said, to say, I'm going to invite these few people in my home. Maybe you've already contacted them and told them what's going on. Maybe you've already set things up and invited them into your home for a meal. I, I pray that you've already done that. But you know what? I really believe it's never too late to do anything like this. It goes on through the 12th, by the way, as you get one of those schedules in the foyer. But you can also order your own DVD too as well. This evening what I like to do is do something that's kind of twofold as we close our service of the Brother David and his made them for us. <coughs> I'd be remiss as a pastor if I could give at least this invitation. To me, it's all about evangelism. We can get to this part of the service. It's about what has God done with what we did to touch the heart of every person in this church today. It could have been the prayer. It could have been the music. It could have been what I've said here that's encouraged you in some way to say, you know, you know, I have not made that decision yet, and I want to make it today. I want to know who this Jesus is. And today is going to be a beginning of that walk with him. So if you're here today and you haven't made that decision, I'm going to encourage you to come in just a moment and let's pray together and let's share together what's on your heart and mind. You can pray with me or you can come and pray at the altar. It's always open at the altar. Is. So I want to do that first. But also I want you to be praying about where you are this week in this wonderful endeavor that's been given to us. That we reach people that we already know. Wow. How awesome is that? That people you already know know who you are and where you are in life with Christ. You see, there's a barrier already been taken down when you do that, folks. Already a barrier taken down because if you were living your life, as the word just said, if you're living your life as the Bible just said we should, then they already know you. Amen? 
They already know your heart through some, some means. In some way that you live your life, they already know. And if they don't, then, then there's, a, there's another problem that you have to deal with and how that you live what you proclaim. Amen. Father, I know this is a, a little bit different worship service today. We're promoting something I think that's very important to the life of every believer. It should be the opportunity that they have to reach somebody in their community, family, friends, co-workers, to really let this video do all the work in a sense and just ask an important question. Do you want to trust this Jesus? So Father, I, I, I ask us to ask ourselves right now, do we really trust this Jesus? Do we trust him with our whole lives? Do we understand what it means to, to be a disciple? While, while salvation is free, discipleship will cost you. It, it costs us our whole life when we live our life and the influence that we have on others around us. So Father, I ask that you speak to our hearts and minds this morning and help guide us in our personal relationship with you. And then help us to see how we can carry out a responsibility that you give it to each and every one of us to reach people around us. And yes, I thank you for this campaign that really helps us in a way to do that. The opportunity to share with people who Jesus is. And Father, I just ask that you touch our hearts and our minds right now. Help us to make that first time commitment if we have not done so, but help us also to understand that it's okay to make recommitments, to make rededications as well. Father, we trust your spirit now as we come to this time of worship. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.